Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So um, today we are going to discuss this lecture, uh, which covered mm, points that we had already discussed in class. So you should be familiar with. It. So the question is, um, see, um, I am trying to argue here that. Uh, first of all, this lecture is designed for a general audience, so the first thing I want to persuade them of is that economics is in big trouble. This is uh, not obvious. So I use these uh, quotations, and there are many others like that, to argue that economists are actually unhappy with uh, economic theory. But actually this is not the complete picture. Uh, is it true that economists have abandoned economic theory? No, it's not true. In fact, even Yanni Krugman who says that uh, the profession as a whole went astray. He has not abandoned it. In fact, he says that he is very much of a classical economist. He just uh, he believes in optimization and equilibrium. He just thinks that small changes are needed. The models haven't taken into account information and tra transaction costs and so on. So we we are basically fundamentally we are in the right place, but uh, the approximations that have been made are wrong, and if you make the right approximations, you will be. Similarly, um, Romer, Blanchard, these are all fairly mainstream economists, and they haven't really given up on economics like I have. So, Um, so what are the strongest lines of attack against economic theory? Uh, I've discussed many of them. Now what I want to discuss is how the economists defend these theories. So there are three types of arguments which are standard. I want you to know what these arguments are and then how to make counter arguments against these. So what is the Friedman argument? This is the famous uh, argument about as if doesn't matter if the assumptions are the Right. The assumptions of the theory don't matter. Um, so there is this famous example that Friedman gave that suppose we assume that the billiard uh, <coughs> ball player is uh, knows the laws of physics and he can make calculations. So then he will play as if he knows the laws of physics. Actually he doesn't know anything about physics, but in fact his play demonstrates his uh, knowledge of physics. So making that assumption we will be able to calculate what he would do. He, so that's... Uh, so the so the billiard ball player plays as if he knows physics. The human beings act as if they are maximizing utilities, even if they are not. Um, so this is also similar to what is called an instrumental views of theories. The theories are good if they work. It doesn't matter that the theory is true or false. Another way that this argument is made is that 
the map is not the territory. So if I make a map, it doesn't actually, of, of uh, Islamabad, the map doesn't resemble Islamabad in any way. Similarly, you can say that the model is never an accurate representation of reality. So, all of these are arguments which allow you to defend theories which are obviously wrong. So, if I say that, okay, look, in ultimatum game, people behave, um, don't behave selfishly, so you can say, well, uh, that doesn't matter for our models. As long as our models predict correctly, then they are valid. So what is the counter-argument to this? We are just saying that assumptions don't have to be realistic. They, that is what Friedman says explicitly, that assumptions can be ridiculous. doesn't matter. Reality of man was both complex, so they are so simple, can you can assumption that they are going to assumption now to reality go say that as explaining us. No, assumptions are always simplifying reality, so assumptions are never right, they always oversimplify. This is actually correct, I mean, this is true. So, I'm going to reality go deeply observe. Hmm. So what he is saying is that the theory is normative, but this doesn't really provide an argument. All right, first of all, uh, this argument can be used to defend any theory. If I say that uh, this world is really run by green goblins, we don't see, and everything that happens, happens because of the green goblins. So. Um, how can I uh, reject that? So, yani, this argument is not sufficient to def defend a theory. All right, you agree that the assumptions are bad and wrong. Okay, so now tell me something good about this theory. Now, this is the thing, this is the place where, um, this is how you can counter-argue that, okay, I agree, the theories are, your theories are, um, the assumptions are wrong, but that doesn't invalidate the theory. So fine, tell me, now the burden of proof is you, tell, uh, is on you. Find me something which the theory does. Where, where is, so actually I, um, any people find this very incredible, so I issued this challenge. Okay, find me any theory from any place in any book in, uh, in economics which does something useful. So people are uh, flabbergasted that this is such a big challenge. Okay, I said, okay, if you can't find that, find me one regression that is true or valid. So there is nothing in the whole ball game from A to Z, it cannot do anything that is, um, that is, uh, I said, okay, find me one economic theory which um, explains something that we see in reality that is not easily understood intuitively without that theory. So there was no answer to this challenge. So uh, the basic uh, argument that is made is that uh, all models are false but some models are useful. Okay, so you have admitted to the falsity of your model. Now show me how it is useful otherwise. And so whenever um, we uh, find a place where the model is useful, I will be able to show that we can understand that phenomena better by using a better model of human behavior, a better model of firm behavior, and because that's, those are true. I mean, anything that you can explain with neoclassical th theory, you can explain better by rejecting neoclassical theory. So, um, that is the counter-argument, but it requires, I mean, work, it's not just... So, um, 
one of the mm, common mistakes that people make is uh, that there is a logical argument that if a theory implies something and you see that thing is true, then the theory is true. This is actually Uh, there are two formal terms for correct argument. So if there is a conditional A implies B and you know that A is true, then you can conclude that B is true. This is called modus ponens. This is a standard form of logical argument going back to Aristotle. So if A implies B, for example, um, if, it, if it is raining, then there are clouds in the uh, sky. So this is a correct conditional statement. So now we add to this, it is raining. So then we can cl conclude that there are clouds. Now the uh, the reverse of this is not a valid argument. So if it is raining, there are clouds. Now we say there are clouds, therefore it is raining. That is not correct. And that is the argument that is very often made. That uh, here is a theory. Theory implies, the supply and demand theory implies that if there is a restriction in the supply, then the prices will go up. So there is a restriction in supply, prices go up, so the theory is valid. No, uh, that's first of all, it's not a valid argument because given a fact, there are always many different theories which imply the same fact. So if every theory which implies that fact uh, is proven by the fact, then all of the theories would automatically be proven. So proving a theory doesn't imply uh, uh, it does not, cannot be done by uh, showing that the implications of the theory is true. Although looking at implications and checking does lead to some confirmation of the theory. And so the best way to argue against this kind of argument is to uh, say that, okay, your theory implies that uh, if the good is short, then the prices will rise. But there are many other ways to explain the same fact. Suppose that there is no equilibrium, suppose that there is no supply curve, suppose there is no demand curve. It's just that the when um, there are few uh, people follow rule of thumb. They, they estimate that about um, so many customers will come in. So uh, for um, tomatoes today, 10,000 kilos will be sold, were sold yesterday, so if they have more than 10,000 kilos, then they say, okay, uh, we will have excess, so let's reduce the price. And if they have less than 10,000 kilos, then they say, oh, this is going to fall short, so we can increase the price. So if they follow this rule of thumb, which has nothing to do with supply and demand, it will also lead to the same result. <coughs> yes. Isn't the Beard player, uh, Friedman's argument of Beard player is valid, like, he doesn't know the supply and demand model, but in uh, reality, he uh, implemented that model. Ah, so the question is, um, Okay, so my theory also shows this fact and uh, supply and demand also seems to suggest the same thing. So both are equally useful in that sense. However, uh, we can say that, all right, how exactly does supply and demand? And then if supply and demand is valid, then at the end of the day, no seller should go away from the market not having purchased. And there should not be any excess of tomatoes left in the stores. So, okay, we can check those assumptions. And there are many others. 
many other implications of supply and demand that all of the sales made are at the same price so that's another implication of supply and demand it implies that all of the sellers are price takers they cannot set the prices so so this is the form of the correct argument that all right so post uh, 2008 uh there has been still any there hasn't really been any change yani the people still keep teaching the same theories uh, uh somebody recently posted on a heterodox blog that he had been looking to see if people have changed the syllabus so now actually minsky's financial fragility hypothesis is a very um good explanation of why the crisis occurred and keynesian theories uh are also very closely related to ideas which give some idea about how the crisis occurred and there are a few other people so he said that he looked at the syllabus of the top 50 universities to see if they have been updated if there is any minsky on these reading lists if there is any keynes on these reading lists and they found that no there has been no updation they are still teaching the same material that they used to teach before the global financial crisis so the question is why why aren't people changing the theories <coughs> why aren't they changing the syllabus why aren't they updating economic theory <coughs> so what do you think see i mean you can see this in your own local environment at qaid azam university they are using the same syllabus that they were using in 2000 at the globe as if the global financial crisis did not occur right at qaid they were doing the same thing actually we are not to the, the macro course that we are teaching is also post crisis and the micro course is also post crisis course but this is rare and unique it's not happening in other places So why aren't they teaching? Why is it? So actually, uh, teachers kept the student in illusion and deception. They are so still conventional economics is useful in determining the real world outcomes. Well, I would say that this is not so fair to the teacher because the teacher himself is in the dark. <laughs> it's actually, all over the world, the universities are financed by donors, and it's in their benefit. Kids are in status quo, and the people benefit from. Yes. And there is also role of power, power of economic theory. Yes. Well, um, at the level of colleges, the reason is very, very mundane. Doesn't have to do with power. Doesn't have to do with politics. That's the only thing the teacher knows. <laughs> he hasn't learned <laughs> Marvin Minsky, and he hasn't learned. Sorry, not Marvin. It's uh, Hyman Minsky. and uh, he hasn't learned about the keynesian theories ever actually nobody ever learned keynesian theories even in when samuelson's uh, book was samuelson was one of the disciples of keynes but samuelson never understood keynes so what samuelson explained as keynesian was not really keynesian theory so um, at one level people just teach what they know and they are threatened by uh change that uh, if uh, economic theory is really flawed then all of the investment that i have made over i have spent 8 years studying this theory and now all of that is useless that's uh, 
people are not happy to accept this. So, um, that's a, a simple reason, but uh, as people were saying, there are more complex reasons. Actually, economic theories support the structures of power. And, uh, for example, Keynesian theory is uh, favors laborers. Uh, and uh, because it says that the government should make sure that there is full, full employment. Now, full employment is harmful to capitalists because they like to have unemployment because then they can hire labor at whatever price and wage they want and without any health and safety conditions. And so that's why the uh, capitalists are very strongly against unions. And they said that the unions always cause damage. Actually, the if the wage market is not perfectly competitive, if the big firms have power in hiring, which is called a monopsony, then the unions can actually counteract that power and therefore lead to a more efficient, more competitive outcome. So, conventional theory argues against the laborers in favor of capitalists, and this is true at, at all points. At all points, the conventional economic theory favors the wealthy and opposes the interests of the poor. So there is a lot of inertia. The corporations are big funders of universities and if the universities teach theories which are harmful to their interests, then they can withdraw funding and they do that and they have done that in the past. So, but there's uh, still another reason and that is uh, that, see, once a person has made an investment in for 20 years, he's not going to change his mind. Even if uh, it's just too difficult to be flexible at once you have absorbed a whole theory than to reject it completely and start from zero is difficult. So it's better to catch them young. So um, Max Planck said that science progresses one funeral at a time. Once one of the old people dies, then there is room for making change. So the question is, who will launch this revolution in economic theory, which so many people have realized, even in, even in mainstream economists like Krugman, he's saying that the profession as a whole went astray. Now, he is making some suggestions on how to fix the things. He's wrong in there, but he realizes, and he and many, many other, I mean, there, there's a whole list of big name economists who have said that there's something very seriously wrong. But, Nobody is prepared to make really radical changes. They say we can make small patches and fix things. The DSGE model is the wrong. Uh, you should not use representative agents and so on. So all of these are little pieces that need to be changed. But to say that the whole thing needs to be changed, very few people are saying that. All of the people are seeing one small error that, okay, this is a problem and if we fix it, we will solve the problem. And everybody is seeing different problems. And so if you combine all of those problems together, then you see that the big picture, that the whole thing needs to be changed. But now, uh, and this is not new, this is, Keynes was also um, very um, disappointed at the economist's uh, ability to accept new ideas and uh, he made many remarks along these lines. He said that in arriving at my theory, the biggest obstacle was not that the new theory is difficult, it's that the old theories were preventing me from seeing the truth. So, many people have been asked about 
why change is not happening in the USA? And uh, the answer is very simple. It's, it doesn't really have to do so much with power as with inertia. There are thousands of professors who are high up in the hierarchy. They are earning fat salaries and they are training students. Every year there's about 5,000 students are getting PhDs and uh, they have been trained in the conventional theories. So uh, if the conventional theories don't work, then um, these students will not be able to get jobs. So, um, and the jobs are controlled by these old professors who take the interviews and use the old theories. So if somebody comes up and says in, at the interview board that everything you're saying is wrong, then uh, he will not get the job. Some time ago I used to tell my students that, look, you have to be careful when repeating what I say outside of class. Mm -hmm. It has actually happened. One of the students, I uh, he was uh, defending his uh, M. Phil proposal, and he said, you know, these all of these econometric theories are wrong. So everybody was <laughs> very seriously offended, and, uh, and uh, he had to backpedal. And I said, look, you can't say that. I can say that, but you cannot say that. <laughs> so uh, there is a lot of inertia. So now, what is the so uh, what we need to do? So. First thing is that this is, exists in the first world, the rich countries. In the poor countries, our interests are aligned with the revolution in the sense that economic theories favors the rich and hurts the poor, so the economic theories are ha harmful to our interests. It is we who are at the receiving end of the uh, hit man. We are getting the hit, so it is in our interest to make the change. Also, we don't have heavy investment, we don't have thousands of people who have PhDs in economics and who are going to put up a strong resistance to change. So, and, and we have nothing to lose in the sense that it is not that the profession is wide open to new ideas. Uh, if you, in fact, uh, it's a very small club. Uh, many people have analyzed that the top 20 journals uh, only the uh, only a small club of economists is allowed to publish in them. Anybody else who sends their paper, um, they will not accept unless you are in the club. It doesn't have to do with the quality of the paper. So here, uh, there is no chance for us to um, get the Nobel Prize in economics, for example. It's not uh, part of the game. The, the, this is not contrary to what you are told, it's not a fair game that anybody has a chance and anybody who works hard can succeed. No, it's very much a rigged game. So here, the regardless of what you do, you will always be a second-rate economist. Second-rate is if you are very good. Third-rate is the uh, So we have a chance to open our own era where we can actually do things. So this is the way that um, we can co-opt our own PhDs because they are the, the uh, making a revolution in Pakistan or in the poorer countries or in the Islamic world, but the biggest uh, resistors will be our own PhD economists. And so we have to, instead of um, any overriding them, we have to co-opt them, we have to take them on board, say that, look, your PhD isn't going to buy you very much, but you can be a leader in the field if you uh, drop the orthodoxy. So, that's one thing. The other thing, uh, the one reason for uh, failure of change in the uh, Europe and USA is because there's too much inertia and the power interests are 
very strongly tied to modern theories, so they won't let uh, real change happen. But the other reason is that the change required is also very deep. It is a problem that is uh, goes that has existed for centuries in European intellectual history. European thought process went astray a long time ago. So the corrections that are required are not small patches. They are really deep and fundamental. And the Europeans don't have the capability to think that deeply in the sense that uh, making a revolution, a paradigm change is very difficult. So these are the three basic pillars on which they have built all of their knowledge. So now to go and uproot those pillars and rethink what knowledge is, is a very difficult thing for them to do. As opposed to this, uh, we have alternatives. We have alternative conceptions of knowledge given to us by Islam. And so for us it is easy to make the change required. We have not absorbed these ideas so deeply. We have not spent centuries living with these ideas and accepting them as the basis for <coughs> constructing knowledge. <coughs> so, uh, basically the history that we have learned is Eurocentric. Eurocentric. It puts Europe at the center of history. It says that everything good was, uh, the whole world was in darkness and then suddenly the sun of reason rose in Europe and then the Europeans became intelligent and rational and they started thinking and they invented science and, and they conquered the whole world and all of us now must learn from them. This is the basic Eurocentric picture. It's You can summarize it by saying that this is the white man's burden story that they acquired all of the good things uh, in Europe and then they realized that everybody else is living in poverty and darkness and so it's our responsibility and to go and share the benefits of our knowledge with the rest of the world. So this is the dominant Eurocentric narrative that we have all absorbed and that you will find repeated in uh, Chaykhanas and in parties and that we are a nation of corrupt people and we are ignorant and we are dumb and we are um, dishonest and corrupt and the white man he is honest and brave and courageous and intelligent and smart all of the good qualities they have and all of the bad qualities we have so um, so, um, well, so why is it important to learn uh, the non Eurocentric history? And what is the non Eurocentric history? Ah, this is this is one counter that yes, Hamare Dada bhi Rustam the. This doesn't really help very much. That yes, fourteen hundred years ago we were led the world. Thousand years ago we were the leaders. So now it is their turn. That doesn't really help to counter the Eurocentric narrative. Pidram Sultan Bud kehte hain isko. My father was a king. I am nothing. <laughs> Once we had our golden age, but now we are nothing. Pakistan still contributes the largest charity in the world. We are good people, you know. Very weak defense. <laughs> so, actually, their traditions, cultures, and other social aspects are different from us. So, 
Why? They are the world leaders. Why should we? Uh, why should we not follow them? I mean, we are behind; they are ahead. So we must learn from them. Neurocentric history is actually individualism. The problem is, but non-neurocentric history is about society. The problem is about society, welfare of the society, not of individual. Sir, in its name, sir, means that the neurocentric history is about the Ram Kesan, the humanity, the religious history, the world. यूटिलिटेरियनिज्म के लेकिन सर हमारे जो मॉरलिटी है सर वो उससे हट कर वो नहीं है कि मतलब उन वो जिन चीज़ों को मॉरलिटी या बेसिक कंसिडर करते हैं या अनऑब्जर्वेबल को सर वो हम उन चीज़ों से हट के मतलब हमारा कुरान भी है जो हमें गाइड करता है सर उसमें बिन गुड Ah, so, <coughs> well, <coughs> all right, so let's look at the white man's burden story. Is this story true? Is it why the, the, the Europeans were so uh, benevolent that, you know, we have this knowledge and we have to share it with the poor people of the world? And that is why they went out and conquered India and yeah. Africa. No. No, why did they do that? They have more resources. <laughs> yes, well, they for. So was this very um, a very uh, gentle and noble conquest where they took? They were very sensitive to human rights and they took care of the needs of the natives and they made sure that the poor were fed and so on. So actually, they made their own people. What? Actually, all the good they want to do to their own people, not to others. Others they don't want to consider even humans. Yes. Like. So, throughout history, there has been a, a n pattern that civilizations grow and then they become decayed, mm -hmm. and then they are conquered by barbarians because once you are degenerate and decay and in the lap of luxury and enjoying you, you don't you forgot how to fight and so the young and uncivilized and barbaric nations uh, conquer so this is exactly what happened the uh, when the Europeans were uh, continuously fighting each other uh, it was 300 years war and so on and many people have said that over the centuries of European existence, there have been very few years where somebody was not at war with somebody else. As opposed to this, the Chinese civilization was a civilization, not a collection of barbarians. Similarly, the Islamic civilization, similarly the Africans, similarly the Incas and the Aztecs and the Mayas, they were all civilizations living peacefully. So, for uh, 300 years they kept fighting each other and they kept getting better and better at warfare. In, in particular, they got some inventions like the gunpowder from China and, and um, some other in inventions they stole from other technologically advanced nations like, you know, um, crude sailing. Crude huh? crude Crude oil was much later, much later. I'm talking about the early. So, in fact, they didn't know calculus and trigonometry. And calculus and trigonometry was required for sailing because the surface of the sea is curved. And so you need tables of the sine function in order to be able to navigate properly. So they didn't have those. And in fact, there was a prize offered by the king of Portugal or somebody that thousand pounds for accurate and these were all available in India calculus was actually invented by uh, a school in um, Madras or somewhere like that 
and uh, it was stolen. Uh, that is, it was translated by Portuguese monks and it was taken and that's why uh, Newton and Leibniz discovered it at the same time because it had uh, suddenly come, become available. So the infinite series etc they are all in India and, uh, and the tables of science they, they were also that they needed to navigate they also got these from Indian mathematicians and so anyway the thing is that they uh, by various uh, accidents and primarily because one of the things that they were very skillful at which no uh, nobody else accepted was uh, expected was treachery in their uh, culture it was permissible all is fair in love and war it was permissible to deceive people that saying that yes we are on your side and then betray him on the next day uh, Machiavelli said that uh, the game is all about winning and it doesn't there are no rules all over the world in all civilizations there were rules Islam jihad is a holy object and you can't lie to your enemies even uh, and you can't break treaties and uh, there are many, many rules which you have to follow. You cannot hurt innocent and weak and uh, non-combatants and so on. These rules which they finally learned in the Swiss uh, Geneva Conventions after thousands of years of... And even then they have just written them down. They don't follow them. So these rules have been with us 1400 years ago. So because of their treachery, deceit, dishonesty and their um, powerful weapons which had developed because of continuous warfare while the rest of the world had been at peace. They managed to conquer the world, destroy all the existing civilizations, loot and plunder and that's how they became rich while the rest of the world became poor. So that's what Stavrianos has written in the Global Rift that uh, you know today Today you can read uh, hundreds of books with the title Why the Wealthy Nations Are Wealthy and Why the Poor Nations Are Poor and literally um, hundreds of people have written about different theories that the Indians are lazy and the white man is hard working, that they are smart, they have science, we are stupid, we don't have science and X, Y, Z, there are hundreds. Uh, there is a um, historian called Blout. He has written 30 different reasons why uh, uh, why European historians in Eurocentric histories say that Europe managed to conquer the world. Why, uh, why the West, the rise of the West, this is one of the books. So anyway, uh, the simplest answer, you see, if I steal all your money, I will be rich and you will be poor. <laughs> this is no, it doesn't require writing a whole book about how he is lazy and incompetent and dishonest and that's why. And it doesn't prove anything about their superiority. If I show you a knife and say, okay, give me everything you have, this doesn't prove that I am superior. <laughs> so, uh, the, this is the Eurocentric history is, is, is exactly, uh, leads to a very uh, deep and serious misconception about the nature of reality we live in. And this the Eurocentric history is continuing today. Uh, America attacked Iraq saying that, oh, they have this evil dictator, we are going to free the nation, give them democracy, and we are going to protect the world from weapons of mass destruction, which they knew that Iraq didn't have. They were just lying to their public. So wh what was the real reason? Well, they, it was to get the control of the oil resources and to provide money to the military-industrial complex, which uh, which made uh, trillions of dollars on this, at the expense of um, the lives of millions of people. So this this is exactly the white man's burden story. At the America, they were so concerned about the fate of the poor Iraqi people, who didn't have democracy, and they were living with this cruel dictator that they went in with only their interest at heart. They didn't have any self-interest in this transaction. So this is the white man's burden story. So, which everybody believes, by the way, this is the problem. 